Our Wednesday nights are off to a great start with our, our children's ministry and our student ministry and all of our adult discipleship groups. And so I hope uh, you have found a place to plug in and get involved on Wednesday nights. Uh, there's so much going on here at First Baptist. Uh, but if you've kind of slow to commit, slow to find a place, uh, maybe what I'm about to share with you uh, will kind of pique your interest and cause you to want to get involved. So um, on Wednesday, September the 11th, starting on that Wednesday night, I'm going to be leading a four-week seminar on uh, Wednesdays. And the topic is going to be this book, The Anxious Generation. So during my normal pastor's Bible study uh, from 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall to 7.15, we're going to walk through this book. So uh, this book by a guy named Jonathan Haidt um, diagnoses what he believes is the reason why he calls the great rewiring of children's brains. That's you guys on the first couple rows. And so Haidt diagnoses this problem. Your brains have been rewired, which is why um, many teenagers and adolescents are now suffering at extremely high rates, uh, anxiety and depression. And what Jonathan Haidt believes is this, is that the, the primary cause or force in our culture that has led to this development is the replacement of a child-based, um, a play-based childhood with a screen-based childhood. Um, specifically, exposure um, to social media, um, but also just having an iPhone in general or your Samsung device or whatever your smartphone might be. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through over the course of four weeks, the content of this book, um, for about an hour and 15 minutes each week, we'll go through a series of the chapters, hitting the highlights, and then we're going to connect it to God's Word and see maybe how God's Word can speak into the research we are going to be exposed to in the book, and then have a time for a question and answer and discussion on how do we implement and maybe change the structures of our families and the decisions that we're making based upon the facts that we're learning. Now, if you're unable to be with us on Wednesday night because you have already have a place where you're served and you're involved, I got good news for you. We're going to go over the exact same content on Sunday nights. So week one uh, for Wednesday nights is September 11th, but week one on Sunday nights, our Sunday night sessions at 5 o'clock, and we'll be meeting upstairs in the youth room, um, will begin on September the 15th. Now, this kind of discussion, this seminar, is for anyone who cares about kids, or it's for teenagers and kids themselves who are interested in learning of what is this phone that we are looking at so often doing to myself or my Instagram account or my TikTok account or my Facebook account? How is it actually rewiring my brain so that myself or my friends were suffering from depression and anxiety? Um, it's for moms and dads who have children living in their home. It's for folks who um, are in the grandparent stage of life. Um, it's for people in our church who are prayer warriors and who want to pray for the next generation. Um, it's for the newlyweds who are thinking about having kids someday and they're figuring out how should we structure our family? What should it look like? You see, um, smartphones are such a part of our everyday life and so is social media that really the discussion we're going to be having on Wednesday nights for those four weeks and on Sunday nights, there's something I think anyone in this room can glean from it and benefit uh, from it. So I really hope to see more of you. We usually have 75 or 80 in my pastor's Bible study. I'd love to see us have to open up the back room, back part of the fellowship hall on, on Wednesday nights. And I'd love to see many more of you who can't be there on Wednesday nights join us on Sunday nights for these discussions. Uh, I really think it will not only strengthen your family, uh, but it's going to strengthen our church as well. So today we're uh, moving forward in our series, Life Hacks, as we wrap it up. And I first want to remind you of four letters. I think you're probably familiar with them. These four letters are T, G, I, and F. T, G, I, F. Thank goodness it's Friday. You know, that acronym, thank goodness it's Friday, it, it sort of begs the question, why am I so thankful when Friday rolls around? Have you ever thought about that? 
And it's not because you get to watch Full House on Friday nights. That was TGIF when I was growing up. Full House and Family Matters. <laughs> Maybe you're thankful when Friday rolls around um, because you know you get to turn off the laptop and watch the game or go to the game you've been looking forward to. Or you have the opportunity and you put down the briefcase or the backpack and you can pick up your uh, set of golf clubs. Uh, you can take off your suit and put on a pair of shorts. Or maybe you're grateful when Friday rolls around uh, because on Saturday and Sunday you don't have to set an alarm. Ultimately, I think most of us are excited when Friday afternoon rolls around because we know that we get to shift gears on the weekend. Uh, we get to shift from the frenetic um, pace of the week where someone else tells us how to spend our hours and where we have to be and what we have to do. And over the weekend, we get an opportunity maybe to relax a little bit more or at least decide um, with more freedom how we're going to spend the hours that we are given. But I hate to break it to you, Monday's always right around the corner, isn't it? The weekend is always only 48 hours long. And so on Monday morning, what we do is we have to exchange the TGIF for four more letters, O-N-I-M. Oh no, it's Monday. And not is it just, it's Monday, it's Monday again. It's back. And maybe you say, oh no, because next week, Monday morning, the first thing that crosses your mind when you wake up in the morning is the three tests you've got next week and the two quizzes and the paper that you've got to turn in. Yeah, true that, right? Oh no, it's Monday. It's the week I've been dreading coming up. And many of us say, oh no, on Monday morning because uh, the work that we're going to be faced with over the next five days, it can feel a little overwhelming. Others of us, it's, oh no, it's Monday uh, because our boss, let's just be honest, let's cut to the chase, our boss is a piece of work, all right? They are unreasonable, unpleasant, unbearable. No one wants to be around them. And you get to spend five more days in their presence. You feel like you're living a blessed life. For others of us, it's, oh no, because of our... Um, our classmates or our colleagues at the office, like you're just really tired of all the snide comments and all the rude words and all the, the, the meanness and negativity. And it just feels like it's too much to spend five more days filled with those realities um, for all your waking hours. Or it could be, oh no, because you're going to sit behind a desk next week, and for those 40 plus hours, or you're going to be at school next week, uh, Monday through Friday. Well, uh, I, I forgot, you get tomorrow off. Good job, guys. Thumbs up. Um, I don't want to harm anyone. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. Yeah, I know that's how my kids feel. Um, but you spend those hours, whether at work or at school, and, and you think to yourself, oh no, because you're not sure that what you do even matters. Has anybody ever felt that before? Like, like, like what you've been called to next week, that anyone outside of the walls of your home, they could not care less about the work that you're doing. You know, for those reasons and, and many more, check this out. Only 20% of adults in the United States like strongly agree with the statement that I really like what I do every single day. 20% of adults in the United States strongly agree with the statement, I really like what I do every single day. That means 80% of adults, and if we're a cross-section of the United States, 80% of the adults in this room find it really easy to say, oh no, it's Monday. And did you know this, that according to the CDC, this is a really interesting factoid, um, according to the CDC, 9 a.m. on Monday morning, that's the peak time that people have heart attacks as they return from the weekend and go back to work. You know, many of us, when we think about work, um, the phrase we attach to work is this phrase, necessary evil. I've gotta get through the work 
and I have to endure the work so that I can enjoy my life, so that I can uh, get to the things that actually make me happy. But that mindset really sets up a problem for us because, again, God's word and statistics tell us that meaningful work actually is a predictor of overall kind of fulfillment in life. Um, that, that very same Gallup poll that I, that I mentioned uh, tells us that um, whether or not a person enjoys their job, that's actually the most determinative factor in their life for whether or not they experience like an overall, um, overall happiness and um, purpose in life, their overall well-being. And people who enjoy their job, they're, they're twice as likely to be thriving in life overall. And, and then God's word tells us this. This is Proverbs chapter 12. says that the diligent find freedom in their work. The lazy are oppressed by work. Think about the first half of that verse. Is it really possible? Have you ever thought of the possibility that work can be freeing? Because I think for most of us, work feels like chains, doesn't it? Work feels like bondage. Work feels like um, a force acting on us from the outside that we get no say about. But what if God's word is right, and I think that it is, and what if work could be freeing? And if work is freeing, do you know what that means for us? It means that work can bring fulfillment in a person's life. It means that work, um, not only can it bring fulfillment, it can allow us and, and be a kind of an avenue by which we enjoy the life that God has given to us. You see, enjoying life, it's not just something we can experience on Saturday and Sunday. It's something we can all experience Monday through Friday. And that's why we have to learn to apply, to accept and apply today's uh, Christ-centered solution. Like I said, we're wrapping up this series, Life Hacks. Um, we think of Life Hacks typically as these creative solutions for everyday problems. Um, but really, those sort of Life Hacks kind of skim the surface of life. Uh, so in this series, what we've been doing is, is searching God's word for Christ-centered solutions, that is, solutions that really reach to the core of our personhood and reach to the level of our soul that have the potential to transform who we are, these Christ-centered solutions. So we applied a Christ-centered solution uh, to our biggest problem in week one. We talked about the human heart, that combination of our attitude and our mind and our will and our disposition um, from Scripture. Uh, we talked about it in week two about applying a, a Christ-centered solution to our issue with time. Uh, remember, we talked about how our time in week two needs to be um, organized by Christ and prioritized around Christ. And then last week in week three, we, we looked at that uh, realist of the real problems, our problem with worry. Um, and, I, and I taught you that prayer at the end of our time of worship um, where we just simply pray to God, um, I give everyone and everything to you, God. I give everyone and everything to you. And one of the things that you and I, we need to give to God is our nine to five. It's our, our work life. And, and the solution begins with accepting and applying this truth. And here it is, is that work is a gift and a grind. Work is a gift and a grind. That means that, child of God, you can find freedom and fulfillment and even enjoyment when you go to work tomorrow morning. But you have to root your experience of work on that biblical truth. We have to accept it and, and apply it. And, and when we do, we can trade the, oh no, it's Monday, and it can be, thank goodness, it's Monday. Thank goodness, Monday rolled around again. Another opportunity to get to go to work, to get to go to school. And I know like that sounds terrible to so many people, especially the school part. But it can be the same for going to school as well. 
that if we just realize both work and school are a gift and they are a grind. And to let this truth kind of begin to sink into our human hearts, to, to transform the way we see the world and we act in the world, um, let's open our Bibles now to Genesis chapter 2. Um, we all have different Bibles in the room, different size Bibles, size of the print, but Genesis 2 should be on or around page 5 in your Bible. Um, that's where it is in mine. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And I'm not even going to read the entire verse. Let's just pay attention to, to what is recorded for us when it says that on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. Hear it one more time. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. There are so many debates that center around how to read and how to interpret Genesis 1 and 2. And, and because of the debates that we have around these texts, sometimes we lose sight of these great pearls of wisdom that God has revealed for us. Because according to Genesis 2, verse 2, this is a pearl that we just lose sight of in the course of these debates. According to this verse, before a human ever went to work on the earth, God worked while he created the earth. Before a human ever had a job, God had a task, a work that he began and that he completed. And that is profoundly important because it shapes our conception of what work is. You see, to say that work is a gift is not the result of an economic philosophy. It's not the result of your mom and dad or your grandparents instilling this great uh, work ethic within you. It's not the result of having the job of your dreams. It's not the result of um, earning more money than you could have ever imagined. Work is a gift. Listen to this. Work is a gift first and foremost because it's a reflection of the very character and nature of God himself. Before God ever asked us to work, he went to work. And in the ancient world, um, this is a really big point of contrast between biblical faith, right? The faith that centers around uh, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and, and the Jesus who we meet in the pages of the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit who comes at Pentecost. This is a big point of contrast between our true faith and the faiths and religions that fill this world, especially the ancient world. So in the ancient world, um, all the ancient religions taught this idea that the gods, no matter who they were, they created human beings to do all the work for them. The gods of the other ancient religions, of the other ancient nations, they never did a day of work in their life. It was the job of people to plant all the seed, till all the ground, harvest all the crops, and bring an offering to those gods so they could eat. Because all they wanted to do in their stories, those gods spent all their days napping, all their days in leisure, all their days doing whatever they wanted to do, while people like you and me did every ounce of the work. Uh, when you look at the religion of ancient Greece, okay? So Zeus never worked a day in his life. Every need he had was met by the people. As a result, do you know this? That in ancient Greek cities, if you were a tradesman, you were also a slave. You were not a freeman. A freeman would not want to work because you would not be like one of the gods. Because the gods didn't work. Work was demeaning. 
And there were actually these cities in ancient Greece who outlawed their citizens from having a job. Because for uh, work to be worthwhile, for, for the good life to occur, uh, the philosopher Aristotle says, you couldn't work. You should not work. You should never desire to work. By contrast, God's word, Yahweh, teaches us this, that the one true God, not, not the idols of the nations, but the one true God, he worked from the dawn of time. He worked to create this world. As a result, any work we are called to do, it's not demeaning, it's dignifying. It has the potential then to ascribe value and bring fulfillment in a person's life because God worked before he ever asked us to work. If you continue and look forward now in, in verse uh, 15 of Genesis 2, just a little farther down, verse 15 says that the Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So God worked when he created, and then when he makes Adam, he immediately puts him in the garden, and he says, it's time to get to work. And just like God placed Adam in Eden, he has placed you in Hot Springs, Arkansas. He's placed you in Garland County to continue the work that he has already begun. That's why we say work is a gift. Because an opportunity to work is an opportunity to continue what God has already begun. Now, for some of us, it's really easy to see how our, our work can be in partnership with God, right? Uh, it could be that you're a teacher in this room and you've committed your life to education and um, because of the way that you love and you pour into students every single day, um, you, without a doubt, because you work for the good of those kids and you want to see them flourish and grow up and mature, like it's clear you're partnering with God. And, and the same could be said for, for nurses in the room or think of coaches and what they pour in, into students in the next generation. Um, and I think, but I think for some of us, like you're a lawyer and like how does that fit into what God wants to do in the world? I'm a banker. How does that fit into what God's trying to do in the world? Is, am I really continuing uh, God's work here in Hot Springs? Am I really partnering with him? And this morning, I want you to know this. You too, no matter what your job is, you can find freedom. You can find freedom in the work God has called you to. It can bring fulfillment to you. It can bring enjoyment to you. Do y'all know the name Martin Luther? Y'all familiar with the name Martin Luther? Okay, started the Protestant Reformation. You went to history class and church this morning, okay? Um, started the Protestant Reformation. He, he nailed a, a very strongly worded message on the door of a church many years ago. Well, Martin Luther was also a great thinker. Um, and he was kind of posing the question we're asking this morning of like, what do people do when Monday morning rolls around? How do they understand that their work is valuable? That their work matters not just to themselves or even their family, but matters to the world and matters to God? And Luther, he began to reflect upon uh, Psalm 147 verse 13 which says that he strengthens the bars of your gates and blesses your people within you. Uh, with that phrase, strengthens the bars, the psalm is reminding us that God seeks the security, um, he seeks the peace, and he seeks the prosperity of his people. And that includes the cities and the communities where they call home. And that's why we know this, that any way that a person can go to work and perform a, a job Monday through Friday and even many times bleeds over into the weekend, 
Anytime they go about that and their job contributes to what? The well-being, the security, the growth, the prosperity, the, the flourishing of a place, that person and their job are the, the fingers and the feet of God at work in the world. I mean, think about it this way, okay? Um, in Hot Springs, Arkansas, that means that God strengthens our city Hear this, God strengthens our city through the work of police officers, through uh, the work of ambulance drivers and firefighters, uh, through the work of our mayor and, and, and the mayor's office, because why? Those things contribute to a city that is safe. And, and you know, when it comes to our, our city, you know, we also need um, the ability to get around and to navigate our city, right? Like a, a vibrant city that is being strengthened, uh, people need the ability to freely move about. You know what we need then? We need city crews that repave our streets. They're a part of God's plan for Hot Springs, Arkansas. Some of y'all, I got a, that was the loudest thing, man, I've gotten in a long time about the people repaving the streets. We all like smooth streets, don't we? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. But you know what? For also for our, our, our city to be strong, it needs to be just, right? God's justice needs to be present. And I think that's why God works through lawyers and paralegals and judges to make this community stronger and their work matters. Um, God, he strengthens our city when uh, people have the freedom to start small businesses. So uh, those loan officers who give small business loans, they can be the, the hands and the feet of the Lord. So are the, the entrepreneurs who take a chance and follow their passions and, and use their God-given gifts to start a new venture. And to have a strong city means that families like yours, we have to have places where we can call home, like roofs over our heads. And so uh, realtors, like you have a, a place in God's um, plan for hot springs and, and your work matters. So too, um, the work of builders, your work matters and electricians and plumbers and framers. And in our own community, as we enjoy the outdoors, those who work in, in leisure and hospitality, your work matters as well. And you know what? Like I said, we like to get around our, our city streets, and so we got to put fuel in our cars. That means you need someone who's like the, the, the clerk at the gas station, and you need someone who will drive the, the tanker truck that delivers the gas to the gas station. It doesn't just show up in the ground ready to go in your car. God, when he gives people jobs and calls us to work, he wants us to know our work matters when it contributes to the well-being of the community and of the city where he has placed us to live. That's why we can say not, oh no, it's Monday, but thank goodness it's Monday and my work is a gift. Because the work God's given you, it allows us to build together a stronger community where we can flourish and we have opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. But even though your work matters, even though your work has dignity, I got to break it to you. It's not ever easy, right? We don't have to act like it's going to be easy and pain-free and hassle-free. That's why we said that what? Work is a gift and a grind. Check out what happens in, in chapter 3 then, when the Lord, sin has entered into the picture and the Lord speaks this to Adam and Eve when he says that the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat. Work is a grind. I, in my 10-year high school reunion, I was talking to a buddy of mine. I vividly remember this conversation, even though it was like 15 years ago. Um, I said, so, hey, man, how's, how's your work going? He was an architect. Been to, went to Fayetteville, got his architecture degree, licensure, and all that. I was working at a big firm in Little Rock. I was like, so how's work going? 
He's like, I like it. It's not a hobby. Think about that. I like it, but it's not a hobby. Do you see what he was saying? Like, I'm really enjoying what I do, but it's not like everything's just fun every single day of my life. Like, problems emerge, things break, plans don't go according um, to how I had dreamt of them going, but I still like it. Because he kind of got it. Like, work is what? A gift? And it's a grind. When you go to work and a problem emerges, don't be surprised about it. (laughs) Thorns and thistles. There's going to be sweat on your brow. So you're going to get, tomorrow you may get in an argument with a coworker. That's a thistle. Or tomorrow, uh, your secretary might quit and and your client may um, have unreasonable demands that they want to put on you. That's a thistle. Tomorrow there's going to be sweat too. Tomorrow you're going to have to take a test and you're going to study or Tuesday you'll take a test and you're going to have to study harder than you've ever studied for that test before. Or you're going to be asked to do something that you had wanted to do but once you're faced with doing it, it's harder than you ever imagined it would be. But just because those things are a grind doesn't mean they're not a gift. Where you get to stretch and you have the opportunity to grow. And maybe that kind of brings us to this point. How then do we accept the work we're going to do as a gift? How do we accept it? We have to remember who we're working for. It's why in the month of August we read every week in worship the words of Colossians chapter 3 verse 23. That whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. You can accept the gift of work because when you're sitting at your desk or working with a client, you're not working for the person you see with your eyes, you're working for Jesus Christ as he sits on his throne in heaven. He is your boss. He is your master. And as we think about working for Jesus, I think we always need to remember this. We got to remember the work Jesus did for us. You see, Jesus understood that work is both a gift and a grind. He experienced that maybe most um, uniquely when he went to the cross. Like the cross is a gift, that work is a gift because it offers to the world the free gift of God's salvation, right? Because of you, because of Jesus' work, you and I, we can be brought into the family of God. We can become citizens in God's kingdom. That gift is offered to us, a free gift that we receive by faith through the work of Christ and his cross, but it's also a grind. We, we can't move beyond the fact that the, the cross was painful. It was humiliating, and there was the pain of the, the spikes and, and the pain of the mocking words and, and the grind of, of having the spear driven into Jesus' side. But at the cross, the work was the gift and the grind. And so when we become followers of Jesus Christ and we realize the the gift and the grind of the work of Jesus Christ, it becomes all the more bearable for us to move forward in the gift and the grind of Monday through Friday. Because we, listen, we are not doing anything that Jesus himself hasn't done and far exceeded through his life on this earth and his death on the cross. So tomorrow morning, well, you get a day off maybe tomorrow, Tuesday morning, how about that? You'll be happy for Monday morning tomorrow, I know that. But on Tuesday morning when you wake up, you can say, thank goodness. 
one more week, one more day when I get to work for Jesus Christ because I know he has done the even greater work for me and for my benefit through his cross. Let's pray together. So Father, we come before you now with humble hearts and we ask, Lord God, We ask, Lord God, that you would help us understand how what you're calling us uh, to carry out Monday through Friday when we go to work, whether that be school or the office, Lord, how it does matter and it's a gift from you. A gift when we uh, get to contribute to this community and build people up. A gift when we get to grow ourselves. A gift when we get to prepare for the future. And so, Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would transform our attitudes right now. That our own no would become, thank you, Lord. Use our work for the good of other people, God. Use our work to help nurture a healthier hot springs. And as your word teaches us, we we pray for the peace and prosperity of our city so that um, your gospel can easily spread. Not that you need our peace and prosperity, but we know that we'll, just this freedom of movement, Lord God, we know that um, people, we can reach people. And Lord God, I pray, that when hardship occurs, we would know that you're still with us and you don't want us to give up. And I pray specifically, God, for that, that single mom or that dad in the room who um, is looking for a job and they haven't found it. They want to go to work. And, and for whatever reason, they haven't found that job. And I pray, Lord God, that you would provide the job that they need so they can... Um, find fulfillment and even enjoyment and they can serve you each day. Lord God, that, um, that's the, the force that feels arrayed against them right now. And, and we trust that the battle is yours and we place it in your hands. Oh God, transform our outlook for how we spend our daily life when we go to work and school. In Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing just one more song together now. And as we we sing, it might be an opportunity for you to to think through what how you're going to spend your hours next week and, and how God is telling you your work matters. Um, your life matters for the building up of other people for the strengthening of the bars of hot springs. It is a gift from God that you get to work, but there's hardship and trouble. Yes, we know that, but it's a gift. But also, and we make this appeal every week, all of this begins with the work of Jesus Christ. The only reason we can face tomorrow believing that Our work week is a gift and a grind is because of the work Christ accomplished on his cross for the forgiveness of sins. And if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, or you've just, you've heard the name of Jesus and you just don't feel like you know very much about him, but you want to learn more, we would invite you to come forward because we would love to tell you more about him and how you can put your, your trust in him today. Let's stand together now and sing.